Welcome, Welcome to, to Hero, Hero Club. Club. I'm Nick Williams. And I'm George Primavera. George and I started playing Dungeons and Dragons with our buddies in college, and we haven't stopped since. Even when we lived on opposite coasts, I would Skype in George on the TV in the living room of my apartment. While I would DM from the floor of my bathroom so as not to wake up my roommate. When I finally came out to Los Angeles, we started playing with our friends right away. And when we'd inevitably tell other people about the ultimate betrayals and daring heroics that happened in our games, we realized that they were just hearing a jumbled mess instead of the cinematic blockbuster memories that were in our heads. We wanted to show people how fun and immersive immersive D&D can be, especially those who had never played. And to do that, we record a full game like normal around the table and then painstakingly cut it down from four hours to a clean, math-free episode so you can experience our memories the way we do. Just like in a real game, nothing is ever written or planned out ahead of time with the players. The only things we add are music and sound effects. I am the dungeon master. I build the world and the framework for an adventure. The players, like Nick, must then journey through the obstacles I set before them, rolling a 20-sided die and adding character-specific bonuses to see if they succeed. If they beat the number I have in my head, then their action is successful. If not, it is a failure, and there may be consequences. We try to follow the rules of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as close as we can, but as the Dungeon Master, what I say goes, and there are some things I like to do differently. Each season is its own contained story, so find one that sounds interesting to you and start from the top. And hey, welcome, welcome to, to the, the club. club. Hero Club presents The City of Mirrors, Volume 2, Oslo. The Daily Globetrotter is proud to present this week's top scoop from across the globe. Reports have been confirmed that notorious treasure hunter Sir Theobald Derencroft, famous for an embarrassing fiasco involving the sunken ruins of Atlantis, has set his sights on what he has deemed the find of the century. Over the last year, the daring British billionaire has been seen in Montana, East London, and Siberia, of all places, reportedly collecting his team of specialists for the great undertaking of unearthing the alleged lost city of Mirrors. Could this be the crown jewel that puts Derencroft's back on the map? or the final nail in his coffin. Either way, the Daily Globetrotter will be there, so stay tuned. December 31st, 1909, 4 p.m. Bravegate Manor sits resolute amidst a landscape of snow and frosted trees. Winter has come in full force to the island of Great Britain in a showing of immense natural power, though the path from the front gates to the front door has been significantly shoveled. As the oranges of sunset are beginning to suffuse the horizon, a stately carriage drawn by two Clydesdale stallions rolls up to the front gate. A small, leather-gloved hand reaches out of the carriage and outsteps Jade Pickett. Jade has a small, sturdy frame kept warm by a hunter green wool overcoat. Jade's skin is fair with freckles across her nose, and her eyes and hair are wild and dark. Her hair is just barely tamed into a loose bun by what looks like a very sharp silver pin. Underneath her coat, Jade wears a matching green velvet coat and skirt with double-breasted buttons up the front. You can see some very sturdy laced men's boots peeking out under her skirt. And is that a dagger tucked into one? Jade looks up at the huge manor. What a dump! and walk slowly towards the entrance. There is an enormous brass door knocker in the shape of an armadillo, framed by an ornate wreath and a few sprigs of mistletoe. How sweet. Jade looks to her left and to her right, and then knocks the knocker. The door swings open, and standing before you is Nickelback, stoic and professional. Lady Pickett, I hope your journey was pleasant. Antony will retrieve your things. In the meantime, may I show you to the Rustica dining room? Well, I don't know about the lady thing, but yeah, you can take my nanny goat. Antony walks out past the two of you in a uniform very similar to Nickelback's, albeit with a bit less trim and a large scarf. He glares at you as he passes, but he averts his eyes quickly and goes about unloading Jade's materials from the carriage. 
Hmm. Shifty one. Yes, well, Antony is the one that you impaled through the throat several months ago. But worry not, I believe he has forgiven you. Come, come. Right. Sorry about that. The manor's eclectic decor keeps Jade thoroughly occupied as the pair journeys through the house. Mounted above a mantelpiece in a sitting room is a stuffed marlin at least 10 feet long. Along another corridor are hung many pointillistic masterpieces by French painters. And in a small atrium, a replica of an Egyptian pyramid sits on a wide, round pedestal. Finally, Nickelback opens the door to a dining room comprised almost entirely of a light-colored and well-sanded poplar, a woodcarver's dream. Sitting in an enormous cushioned chair with thick, mucky boots up on the table sits Vanya Baranov. The first thing you hear is the sound of striking matches over and over again. Vanya Baranov lights a match on his boot, puts it out on his tongue, throws the match behind him, and repeats the process. Since we last saw him, Vanya's beard is much more well kept. He's put on some weight. He's looking cheerful and healthy, but the crazed look in his eye remains. Ah, apricots or green beans? Apricots. All right. Vanya pulls out a can of canned apricots, crudely crimped at the top with a large wick coming out. He takes a match, lights the wick, and throws it directly at Jade. Jade catches the can in her hand and looks at it for a moment before setting it down on the table. The wick slowly burns down to the top of the can, and right as the flame reaches the lid, it extinguishes with a puff. <laughs> Snovum Godum, my new friend. Welcome, my name is Vanya Bernov, and who are you? You're very new and very brave. The name's Jay Pickett, and I shudder to think of a green beans. <laughs> it is the same thing, but it is green beans. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Yes, yes, Mr. Baranov. Comedic as ever. And he takes the can and pockets it, looking exhausted. Clearly, this is not the first time Vanya has pulled one of his practical jokes with Nickelback present. You know what would be very funny, Nickelback, is if one time it actually was a real one. Nickelback gives a pointed look at Jade, and then departs the room. I shall inform Sir Daringcroft of your arrival, Miss Pickett. Right, see you later, Chuckles. That one's got a real sense of humor, doesn't he? Oh, he is um, very boring. Um, but you, you are, um, you are new. Why are you here? Same reason as you, I suppose. You are also very good with explosives. Oh, no. I'm something of a tea leaf, if you know what I mean. Do you? Know what I mean? I absolutely do not, but I can guess. A tea leaf, yes. These are things soaked in water. <laughs> very hot water. You get in and out of hot water very quickly. Oh, actually, that's rather apt. Let's go with it, yeah. I get out of hot water quickly. <laughs> Chuck another one up for Vanya Baranov. <laughs> no, but what do you do? I still do not know. And into the room walks Theobald Daringcroft with Nickelback in tow. Theobald is holding a small, very decorative little box gingerly in his two hands. Welcome, friends, to Bravegate Manor. Vanya, old boy, I trust you've done your classic cherries or Brussels sprouts trick? Vanya's expression gets unnaturally stony. Brussels sprouts and cherries have gotten very, very expensive in the time that I've been gone. It is becoming a hellscape for the working people. What a shame, old boy. I, I'm so sorry to bring it up, and I was so looking forward to one of your practical jokes. At that, Vanya takes out a can of green beans, lights the wick, and throws it at Theo. Theobald catches the can in one hand and tosses it to Nickelback. Ha ha! Wonderful! Nickelback's eyes widen upon catching the can and immediately licks his fingers and puts out the wick, looking at Vanya for a moment and then shaking the can as it rattles with metal within. The stony expression has left Vanya's face and a big smile emerges. <laughs> Still not the one Nickelback, but you never know. Snowdom Goldom, my friends, this is a very fun day. Nickelback, looking distressed, taps Theobald on the shoulder as he sets the can of green beans down on the ground. Sir, I believe Mr. Mahoney will be arriving within the minute. Shall we retreat to the patio? Splendid, yes. To the patio, everyone. Theobald turns aside to Nickelback once they're out of earshot. Nickelback, still no word from Lady Maywater? 
No, sir, but the evening is young yet. Uh, yes, quite. Well, hop to, man. And Theobald follows the others out to the patio. Yes, sir. The group of four treks through a couple of back hallways until they reach a set of gigantic glass doors, which swing open and lead the group out to a brick patio that overlooks a sweeping white expanse. And suddenly appearing over the tree line is a shining red flying contraption bearing the bright golden name, Lucille. Would you look at that? Just beautiful. Upon clearing the tree line, Bone sees that he has an audience and can't help himself but do a fancy flyby of several barrel rolls. Bones, roll a flight check. 28. The barrel roll is executed in spectacular fashion. <laughs> Happy New Year! And Bones begins his descent to land on the snowy ground. Roll one more flight check. 25. The landing gear disappears beneath the snow as the plane touches down, rolling forward only a short distance before the snow halts it in its tracks. Bones lurches forward as the plane stops abruptly, and the hum of the propeller begins to wane. Bones stands up in the cockpit and waves merrily at the group. He has clearly spent his entire stipend from Theobald on brand new clothes. He wears a rabbit fur trimmed leather flight cap with new gilded goggles, a large, heavy fur overcoat that goes down to about his knees, covering a brand new three-piece suit with the legs of the breeches tucked in to impeccably clean calfskin boots that also go up to his knee. He hops out into the snow, whipping off his goggles and flight cap and tossing them into the cockpit and flashing his signature smile that the group can see even from this distance. Theobald is already wading through the snow out to the plane. Mr. Mahoney, wonderful to see you. Don't you just cut an impressive figure, my man? And he extends his hand to shake Bones's. Ha ha! Doc, it's good to see you again. Not a doctor. Nice digs, Doc. Hot damn. Nickelback, good to see you again, you old so-and-so. Nickelback looks shocked at having been remembered. Mr. Mahoney... Good to see you again, of course. I hope the old doctor's not giving you too much trouble. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a... And who are you two? Not just an audience for my fancy flying, I hope. Oh, yes, how rude of me. Uh, Mr. Mahoney, please allow me to introduce Ms. Jade Pickett. She's our lock and traps expert, our, our burglar. Bones instinctively fixes his hair, knowing that his flight cap must have ruffled it. Madam, he goes to grab her hand and kiss it. I didn't know we'd have members of the fairer sex aboard. Before Bones' hand can reach Jade, she pulls out the silver pin from her hair and holds it to his throat. What do you say about fairer sex? Whoa, feisty. I like that. And what about you, big guy? This robust fellow is our demolitions engineer, Mr. Vanya Baranov. Vanya? What is that, some sort of Bolshevik name? The stern look returns to Vanya's face. He shoots his hand out and offers it. They call me the Rem. Nicknames. I like it. Doc, you really have brought yourself quite a menagerie, haven't you? Bones grabs Vanya's hand and shakes it heartily. Vanya squeezes hard and pulls Bones in very close. Bones matches his squeeze and pulls him back. Both of you make opposed athletics checks. 19. 24. Bones just barely gets the upper hand on Vanya, but both men are pulling each other very close to each other. Isn't this romantic? Bones' razor-sharp jawline flexes momentarily in frustration and a hint of anger, and then he lets it all fall away. What do you have, some sort of canapes in there, or what? Well, I don't know, Nickelback, have we got canapes? Yes, sir. Rogelio has prepared the crudo as requested. All right. Bones walks away shucking his coat off as he goes and yelling behind him to Nickelback, I hope you have those little, uh, those cocktail weenie things. I love those. And lets himself into the house. Nickelback lets loose a mighty sigh, gathers up Bones' discarded clothes, and begins to walk back inside. <sighs> How charmingly brash. Vanya looks down, dejected, and says to no one in particular, I should have saved both grenades for him. Jade slaps Vanya on the back. Oh! All right, man, let's go in. I'm famished. That hurt like hell. The group returns back to the dining room, where Theobald gestures to chairs for everyone to take a seat and takes his place at the head of the table, standing over his little ornate box 
and folding out papers and maps all over the table. Before getting started, Theobald shoots one more hopeful look at Nickelback. Nickelback checks his pocket watch and subtly shakes his head at Theo. Theobald turns back to the group and presses on. All right, everyone, please do tuck in to whatever food you wish or drink. Uh, I've a few points of business to go over and then a toast if you'll all indulge me. Bones went for the first globe he saw and attempted to open it, assuming it was a bar. Are you looking for the bar, my dear man? Yeah, I'd, I'd heard that cushy digs like this sometimes hide their bars inside of globes and the like. What purpose would we have to hide our alcohol? That's a question for you, not for me. I don't have a globe bar. Mr. Mahoney, you may order whichever spirit you require from that gentleman over there. And Theobald gestures to a fully stocked bar with a bartender standing behind it. Meanwhile, Jade piles her plate high with all manner of beast and vegetable and fruits. Vanya goes over to the bar. I'll take an entire bottle of vodka, please. The bartender looks at Nickelback, who thinks for a moment and then relents, shaking his head reluctantly. And the bartender, with some apprehension, places a bottle of vodka on the counter for Vanya. Bones walks up and slaps Vanya on the back in the exact place that Jade slapped him. <laughs> Perhaps we aren't so different after all. Barkeep, I'll have a whole bottle of old granddad rye if you got it. And can I get a rocks glass with ice? I hear you rich folks have ice in your house. Oh, yes, man. Help yourself to all the ice you'd like. Hot dog. Now... The reason, as you know, that I've secured all of your services is because I have planned an expedition to search for the city of Miras, the closest existing parallel to the Garden of Eden itself. Now the story goes, the citizens of the city of Miras were expelled into the catacombs beneath it for the crime of disrespecting Eden's sacred orchard. Where did I hear all this, you ask? Well, where any good tip is heard, I heard it in Morocco, from the chap who sold me this. And with that, Theobald flips open the wooden box he was carrying before. On a red velvet plush pillow sits a shard of a foggy mirror set into a piece of broken stone, upon which are several very cryptic runes impressed into the stone. Though the artifact is rather plain in appearance, it carries with it an aura of mystique. Now these runes here give mention of both Eden and of Adam, although I am awaiting a more exact translation from my contact in Norway, Ridder Hans Ahl. He is the founder of the Norwegian Museum of Cultural History and an expert in Nordic runes and clans. I've consulted the man many times in the past. Now the mention of Eden and of Adam gives me reason to believe that the stories are more than a little related and more than just flights of fancy. And I am sure you're all ahead of me, but Eden in this case refers to the Norse goddess of longevity, not the garden from the Bible. Vanya is in the middle of downing the bottle of vodka, half listening. Jade elbows Vanya. <laughs> on Uh Yes, you seem to be the very smart one. That one, Vanya motions over towards Bones, is a dumb, dumb puppy dog. Bloody septic tank. Bone sidles up next to the two conspiratorially. You're saying they have a septic tank here? This is a nice house. Jade shakes her head and settles back into her mutton. Theobald has noticed none of this. The Bible denotes an east and west gate to the Garden of Eden, but I haven't the faintest idea of where to start looking, which is why I've decided we are starting in Norway. We'll go to visit Hans, who is bound to have a more accurate translation by now and who may also be able to lead us to a potential site of interest. Theobald accepts a glass from a footman and raises it high. And now, a toast. Comrades, I have been to war, and I've attended school, and done many other things in my life, and I have found that there is no greater adventure, no better crucible for one's character or test of camaraderie amongst peers than the pursuit of discovery and exploration. I am humbled that you have all accepted my invitation, and I will be proud to be by your side tomorrow as we head out the door to parts unknown. Thank you. Now let's all get good and soused. And Theobald downs his whiskey. What follows is what can only be described as a vigorous night of binge drinking. Everybody make a constitution save. 
14. 5. 18. 6. The next morning, as the sun peeks over the treetops, our entire crew walks out into the snow bundled up warm. Baranov and Mahoney lead the party outside, nursing pulsing headaches. Behind them, Theobald and Jade walk like zombies through the snow, the hangovers almost putting them on the ground. Nickelback supports both of them under the elbows. Come, come, you two. Oi, Gov. I haven't gotten that cream crackers since my 10th birthday. Neither have I. Did I try to put on your jacket? That's why it's a bit stretched around the shoulders. No matter. You boneheads should have done what I did and fry yourself up a couple of huevos in the kitchen while you had a chance. Each hangover is like a battle skull. It builds up a callus on yourself until you feel no such pain. Keep doing like I do, and you shall be able to walk in the sunlight fresh and clean after a night of absolute debauchery. Vanya, old boy, you never cease to be a bottomless font of wisdom. Bravo! And Theobald drops to his knees and vomits in the snow. Jade steps over Theobald and keeps walking. Oi, Vanya, your singing voice is bloody beautiful. I am happy you remembered. <laughs> also, um, if you ever tell anyone outside of this group that you beat me in an arm wrestling match when you were that drunk, <laughs> I will kill you very dead. <laughs> very dead, my friend. Meanwhile, Nickelback rubs Theobald back in the snow. <gasps> Better out than in, yes. Ah, uh, Nickelback, I got it. Bones trudges back through the snow and bodily lifts Theobald up into his arms like a little baby. Uh, oh. Come on, boss, you can sleep it off on the boat. Oh. Actually, Theobald scrambles out of Bones' arms and uh. excitedly stumbles off, powering through his hangover, but too excited to care. Follow me, everyone! Uh. Uh. An enormous hangar looms ahead, another shapeless mound of snow. Nickelback follows a basically sprinting Theobald towards the front door. Much of the snow has been cleared from the front. Theobald is throwing up again as he waits for everybody to catch up. Oh, oh, I say. Bones opens the door to the hangar. Whoa, that's a big plane! What is sitting in the hangar suddenly becomes clear to all. A truly enormous aeronautical feat of engineering. This airplane looks decades ahead of its time with an entirely enclosed cockpit, gigantic propeller-equipped wings, nose, and tail, and dimensions that dwarf even the largest carriage in Theobald's fleet. The fuselage is painted a subtle gray color, though the great panels of steel that make up the exterior are still discernible. Yes, behold, gentlemen and lady, the Wyvern! Like a little kid on Christmas morning, Bones runs in and begins to inspect the plane from all angles. After seeing your flight show, Mr. Mahoney, and observing your machine, I went home and drew up a design of my own, with a few uh, modifications, of course. The Wyvern is capable of making much longer flights, can sleep our entire crew, and even has a place to store Lucille. Theobald presses a button on the rear of the ship, dropping the door open slowly. A massive cargo space acts as a kind of foyer into this condensed technological marvel. There are tracks in the floor of the initial chamber, as well as several industrial carabiners hanging from the ceiling. On either side of the walls are little cubbies that seem just the right size for a bedroll, and each is outfitted with a luxurious velvet curtain. Beyond, there is a small portal that leads to the cockpit, with a ladder that seems to lead to both an upper and lower level. Bones immediately climbs the ladder, excitedly heading to the cockpit. So many buttons! Before moving forward, Vanya stops Theobald. So you're very, very serious about this one. It's me. When have I ever not been? Yes, it's just... This is a marvel. A scientific feat. Theo, I'm very impressed with you. Did you get smarter when I was away in my little trip? <laughs> Quite the contrary, old boy. I've gotten much more foolish. Also, um, just because of how serious this is, I just have to wonder. Is the cat lady coming? Do you mean Lady Maywater? Yes, I remember names. Well, Vanya, I did extend an invitation, uh, but I worry that I may have come on too strong. At any rate, old chap, Lady Maywater neglected to arrive with all of you, it would seem. Damn shame. I love those giant cats. Oh, well, Vanya waddles off. 
Jade runs her hands across the velvet curtains. So I assume we each have our own... whatever these are. Cubbies? Yes, Miss Pickett. Take, take your pick of any bunk you'd like. Right. I'll take the top. Jade throws her bag up to the top and then starts wandering around the rest of the plane, marveling at its size. Nickelback steps up into the plane as well and addresses everyone. All of your bags have been loaded into the cargo hold beneath. And, uh, Mr. Mahoney, where is Mr. Mahoney? Yeah. A distracted hand waves out of the cockpit high above. Several of the staff are wheeling your very tiny aeroplane into the hangar as we speak. At that, Bones perks up and sticks his head out. Tell him to go easy on the paint job. It's new. The plane is wheeled through the snow behind Nickelback. Mr. Mahoney, did you reconfigure the wings of your plane into that retractable design that I specified? Yeah, I followed the blueprints you sent me. I couldn't figure out why you'd want retractable wings. Bones' question is immediately answered as two of the staff push the wings into themselves, making the plane very skinny, which allows it to fit aboard the wyvern. The landing gear slotting perfectly with the tracks on the floor. Oh. So it's, it's just a storage thing. I thought it would be something more exciting than that, but that makes sense, that's practical. Yes, I'm so sorry to disappoint. Think nothing of it, Doc. This plane puts my rinky-dink operation to shame. Well, Mr. Mahoney, hopefully the two shall be used in tandem expertly. Well, you didn't hire me for my good looks. You didn't hire me for my good looks, right? No, sir, not specifically, but the good looks are a drop in the ocean of quality that you do bring to the table. Well, good, because it, it wouldn't be the first time that I was hired exclusively for my good looks. If we're done romancing, what say we get this thing in the air? Uh, to be clear, it wasn't a good work experience. I'm not gloating here, it was a bad time, had by all. Yeah, I'll get up in the cockpit. Uh, uh, Theo. Yes, Vanya? A technical question. Um, if this whole thing were to catch on fire, how quickly would we die? Well, in my experience, having never been in a plane this large, but having been on many planes that were on fire, you have a solid 15 seconds at least to get to safety before you're completely engulfed. Um, actually, sir, due to the immense fuel capacity of this vessel, should we catch fire, death will be immediate and imminent. Should a small fire break out, we may always evacuate and leave our fates to the winds of chance. Nickelback lifts open a seat inside the cargo hold and pulls out ten backpacks. Oh, yes, these I quite like. If you put these on, these will slow your fall should we have to abandon ship, or rather, abandon plane, midair. Yes, directional parachutes. Speaking of new toys, I have one more item I'd like to disseminate to you all. Nickelback? Yes, sir. Nickelback pops open a jewelry case within which are five little blue earpieces. Now, Vanya, I know you don't believe my accounts about Atlantis, but I think you'll find these little doodads interesting all the same. These, Theobald grabs one and holds it up, are Atlantean earpieces. You pop one of these in your ear, and anyone else wearing such an earpiece can communicate with you over vast distances and with great clarity even when surrounded by extreme ambient noise. Speaking of which... Yes, I shall join Mr. Mahoney in the cockpit. Oh, we are getting underway. I dare say this is my favorite part. The door to the wyvern closes. Nickelback slowly and methodically instructs Bones on the different dials to turn and switches to flip. And with the final turn of a comically large key, the behemoth machine roars to life. Bones pops it in and taps it a few times. How does this thing work? Like a two-way radio? Oh, you, you may speak at a regular volume now, sir. Got it. How does this thing work? Like a two-way radio? Oh, it quit shouting. We can all hear you. Yes, very good. There's Miss Pickett. Uh, Mr. Baranoff? Yes? Uh-huh. Sir Derringcroft. Tally hell! Onward to glory! And the plane begins to pull out of the hangar moving across the snow like a great steamroller. Slowly, the machine's velocity begins to increase as it bounces along the yard unobstructed, flattening the snow in front of it. The propellers on the wings begin to spin with a greater ferocity, and suddenly and unbelievably, the gigantic airplane starts to lift off the ground. Bones grabs the yoke from Nickelback and yanks it back. <laughs> 
and the wyvern ascends into the clouds, leaving Bravegate Manor behind it. The excitement of this enormous machine taking flight wears off over the course of several hours. Nickelback sits in the cockpit with Bones Mahoney, while the other three mill about the cargo hold and the lower cockpit deck. Fluffy clouds whip past several porthole-esque windows. Just absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Haven't seen a view like that since I climbed Nanga Parbat. Vanya has made his way down into the crawl space with all of their belongings. He makes his way over to his trunk and opens it. Inside you see wicks, blasting caps, various pieces of shrapnel, gunpowder, but the crown jewel are these two large fuel tanks strapped together. Hello, beautiful. We cannot have fun right now. This is very dangerous, but um, soon. Shh, shh, shh. The others are listening. Who are you talking to, Mr. Varanov? I am talking to my things, Nickelback. Yes, but you are on a shared channel, Mr. Varanov. Perhaps in a private instance, remove the earpiece. There are no secrets among us, and if there are any, I shall root them out like weeds. I shall find them. If any of you keep secrets from Vanya Baranov, you will explode. What a terrific and healthy attitude to have on this expedition. I, for one, pledge to henceforth keep no secrets from any of you. Jade takes this cue and passes Vanya as he comes out of the crawl space. Jade carefully slips her earpiece into her pocket. She has with her her lock picking kit. She crawls down into the crawl space and goes about picking everyone's locks on their trunks. No secrets, right? Well, all right, let's have a look. Roll Thieves Tools checks for Vanya Baranov's equipment. 24. Vanya Baranov's immense suitcase clicks open and reveals a cache of canned food, improvised explosives, a behemoth machine that you can assume he was just speaking to in a loving manner, and a deck of cards with easily over 150 cards within it. Remind me not to make you angry, Big Bear. When Jade moves to Bones' luggage, it is already unlocked. Well, that's no fun. And reveals several bottles of whiskey, a hodgepodge of worn clothing, many of which are covered in scorch marks and are riddled with holes, and a poorly maintained bulldog revolver. Jade checks to see if there are bullets in the gun. The gun is not loaded, but the bullets are kept in a separate pouch. Nickelback's luggage lies in front of Jade now, very well locked. 12. Nickelback's suitcase is adorned with a safe-like dial, which over the roar of the plane, Jade is completely unable to crack. She sets that aside for later. Next time. And then finally, Theobald's immense trunk. 21. The lid of the trunk falls open with a heavy thud and reveals a classic explorer's khaki and pith helmet, Theobald's rifle, his town clothes and walking stick, and a note on which is written the name Jade Pickett. Jade picks up and unfolds the note with her name on it. Miss Pickett, good show. I had no doubt you'd take a peek into each of our trunks. I do hope you will be respectful of our things and cannot wait to witness your talents used on behalf of the expedition. Again, bravo. Fonley, Theobald Cedric, Plimpton Daringcroft. P.S. There is a tin of butterscotch in the pouch in the lid. Help yourself. I love butterscotch. Fat man. What a wonder. Jade takes the tin and crawls back up the crawl space into the main hangar. Meanwhile, Bones is asking Nickelback many a question regarding the operation of the Wyvern. What do these switches do here? Because in my cockpit, I don't have anything in front. By the way, very comfortable to be inside instead of flying out in the air. You, I can't tell you how cold it is out there. Yes. Well, uh, this here is wind speed, and here is a uh, compass and uh, navigation. Uh, you mean I don't have to hold my own compass? Bones reaches into his coat and pulls out a severely scratched up compass. No, sir, we've provided one here for you in the dash. Wow, hands free. And here are the individual controls for each propeller. Multiple propellers. What a novel concept, Nickelback. Yes, well, I did not come up with it. Don't sell yourself short, I'm sure you would have gotten there. No, no, sir. Unfortunately, my education is fairly lacking in the engineering department. 
That's okay, I didn't make it out of Miss Mary's little red schoolhouse. <laughs> I knew it. And after a four hour flight, the Wyvern nears its destination of Oslo, Norway. There, there, I say, the Norwegian Museum of Cultural History. That is where we'll find our man Hans. Put her down, Nickelback, anywhere will do. Sir, shall we give Mr. Mahoney a chance to land the vehicle? Capital idea, he is our pilot after all. Mr. Mahoney, if you please. Bones rubs his hands together and gives them a crack. Ah, uh, let's do this. Bones takes the yoke and starts to bring her down for an easy landing. Make a flight check. 24. There's a gust of wind as the plane's altitude decreases, which Bones expertly navigates, leading to minimal turbulence. Make another flight check. That would have toppled old Lucille. This thing cuts through wind currents like butter through a knife. 18. Though it's difficult to see from this new perspective of a cockpit, Bones avoids the tops of several skinny trees, bringing the plane down for a hopefully smooth landing. Roll one final flight check. 15. As the plane descends, one of the wings absolutely decimates an ornately cut hedge, taking the head off of a person sculpted from brush. Sorry, mister. And then the plane with a bumpy thud lands on a field of cold, frosty grass, tearing up the earth behind it, and slowly comes to a stop. Well done, Mr. Mahoney. Yes, bravo, man. I have just decided that I love flying. The door to the wyvern slams open to reveal a sprinting figure coming from the museum. Hans Ahl is a seven foot tall Norwegian man, athletically built. He has a delightful curly mustache. He wears an ornate forest green suit, a striped shirt with a bow tie, and a pair of dark brown suspenders that he adjusts with his hands. Oh, 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 oh Theobald! It's so great to see you. We were all watching the skies thinking it could be some invaders from up north. We've never seen such a craft before. How are you? It's been so long. Hans, my dear friend, it's absolutely wonderful to see you. What brings you way out here to the biggest city in Norway this time of year? Why, the pleasure of your friendship, old boy. And uh, perhaps that translation you've been working on and to visit that potential site of interest you told me about. Oh, that can be arranged. But before you come in soon, you might have to explain yourself to the guards. They all thought you were invaders from up north. You gotta come them down. Flanking Hans are several museum employees holding a variety of weapons. Oh, ho, ho, they were gonna kill you. It's okay, boys, put it down. The pitchforks, axes, and guns lower. My word, so sorry, chaps, for the dramatic entrance. Yeah, all good, yeah, yeah? Yeah, all good, all good. Yeah, you, what about you? No, I'm good too. What about you, you still seem a fruit. This a big plume. Hans, are these friends of yours? Yes, it's okay, lower your perch, folks. I've got a torch. I know, I know, we all know you have a torch. I'll extinguish the torch. Nobody cares about your torch. Sorry, sorry about it, talking about a torch. What is happening, sir? Please, come and soon to the museum. He wants us to accompany him to the museum, Nickelback. I shall send you four along. I will uh, watch the wyvern in the meantime. Splendid, Nickelback, thank you. Oi, Nickelback, any chance we could get some lunch when we return? I'm starving. Yes, Miss Pickett. This is how you all remind me of who I really am. Just a no need, Nickelback. Hans, old boy, I was hoping we could try the herring while we were here. Theobald and Hans lead the group into the museum through enormous, almost golden doors, and they begin to walk through the hallways towards Hans's study, passing various Nordic artifacts. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. Ooh, I love showing off my museum. Take a look around. If there's anything that interests you, please feel free to ask a question. Um, yes, actually. Uh, I am not as familiar with the um, Norwegian artillery. Do you have anything like that from ancient times? I would very much like to see how the ancient people made big fires. Well, we mostly just rub two stooks together. That's usually how we got the good fire going. But in terms of combat, 
We sometimes put it on a torch. Isn't that rude, Yermu? You mean if somebody's actually asking about me torch? Yes, this whole group's asking about your torch. Well, we'd rub a stool stooks together, and then no, we'd no, put no, them no, on no, the torch. No. I already told him about the stooks. We'll post that part. Tell him about the torch. Well, here in the newer woo, we had a big problem with the wolves. So we take the torch, right. and we swing it around mm -hmm. at the wolves. And they run a woo, all the way back into the woods. Theobald is hanging on to every word of this exchange, fascinated. Have you told him about the trebuchet? Thank you, Owen. Hans finally reaches a pair of wooden doors that he gently swings open to reveal his very modest study. There's a very neat and orderly desk on which there is a nameplate that reads Director of the Board, Hans All. A globe in the corner of the room, walls filled with books, and hanging from the ceiling is a replica of an ancient Viking ship. Mounted above the fireplace is an oil painting of a beautiful woman. In she a looker? Who's that? Oh, that's just my wolf. Your what? Oh, no, no, no. So sorry, so sorry. Wife. All oh, right. She's beautiful. Anywho, uh, what would you like me to look at to do? Theobald produces the piece of mirror with the stone border. Well, Hans, in your last letter, you had told me you were able to make out both Eden and Adam. But I had hoped that seeing the artifact in person would help you to produce a more complete translation. Why don't you ploop it on the table right there, and I'll take a look. Right here. Theobald sets the mirror set into the stone on the table. Oh, oh yes, very interesting. Uh, Jessica... Yes. Could you grab me my magnifying glass? Sure thing, Buzz. Come on, Owen. Okay. While waiting for the magnifying glass, Hans takes a good long look at the mirror and the runes on the stone. He studies them intricately, running his fingers over the runes, maybe even looking at a little bit just to understand what kind of stone it is. Okay, okay, very interesting. Here's your magnifying glass. Thank you, Yersaku. Go get yourself a cup of hot cooker. Right away, Buzz. Okay, let me see here. Man, man, man. Runes. Runes. Okay. Looks like. Let me check this book. Hans goes to one of the many bookshelves and pulls out a gigantic book. Okay. Yes, of course, Odenung. It's a clone from Old Viking Post. Oh, this should help me get a better translation. Just a moment, Hans. You're saying this is a. Uh, an ancient Viking clan, yes? Yes, what didn't you understand about old Viking clan? No, I'm just trying to keep up, old boy. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> For Eden's children only, led by Adam. Ha! Ah, so they are connected. The Norse and the Christian myth both. <laughs> yes, that checks out. You knew the site I was mentioning to you earlier. Yes. I found an Edenung rune at the site on a big stone. Well then, old chap, the connection cannot be denied. We must go at once. <laughs> I love Spelunkin. Miss Pickett, everyone, how are you all feeling? Are you hungry? Huh? Oh, sorry, I was just staring at this picture of this strange cowboy on a horse with eight legs. Uh, that's Odin, the old father from Norse mythology, my man. Huh? He is one of our old goods. Oh. Uh, what I'm asking, Mr. Mahoney, is should we all have lunch before we go? If you want to, you can have Yermu, Yesaku, and Owen prepare you a chicken lunch. Wait, well, I certainly won't turn it down. Whatever you have that's most authentic, my man. Authentic and quick. You can cook the chicken on my toot. After a hearty chicken lunch is prepared and delivered to the whole crew inside Hans's office, Hans jumps behind a changing partition, and you start to see his suit in various pieces flop over the side as he changes. So, we are about to go spelunking. The key to a good spelunking is making sure you have enough light to sustain you throughout the dark, dark caves. So, you might want to prepare with some suits and some clothes that I have lined up in front of you. Wear some hard hoots, some harnesses, and get yourself some crampoon climbing spooks on your shoes. Bones holds up his tiny wetsuit to his very large frame. Uh, I don't know if this will fit. Jade walks over with her incredibly large wetsuit and says, Ah, oh, I think we better switch. No worries, it'll eventually fit. I'm wearing a child-sized smooth. And Hans peeks out from behind the partition in a shockingly form-fitting wetsuit. Oh my. I'm rooted for the curves. 
I have a very important question. How much of this cave system is still yet undiscovered? How much um, do we need to move large amounts of stone? Will you need any kind of demolitions or explosions? I don't believe we will. I've been exploring these caves for a number of months now. It's a good way to pierce the team. Vanya throws down his wetsuit in a huff. Then why am I even here? Oh, these pissed off. Oh, God. Yeah. Vanya starts kicking at the ground, just in a huff. Ugh. Jade walks over to Vanya and pats him on the back. Oh. Oi, caves have been known to cave in, as it were. We might need your help getting out, not getting in. Theobald joins Jade on the other side of Vanya. Quite right, Miss Pickett. You never know what we might encounter. Bones joins the group, wearing his half-hearted attempt at putting on the teeny tiny wetsuit. Uh, yeah, no, but I, I do seriously need to switch with you, Jade. Cutting ahead to the whole crew piled into a tiny Norwegian car. Hans is at the wheel, his knees basically at his shoulders, and points ahead to the massive stone that is emblazoned with a carved Edenung symbol. I discovered it a few weeks back and I couldn't believe my ears. The English translation is Orchard Passageway. Orchard Passageway. I say, old chap, this could be an entrance to the City of Mirrors. Hans, tell me, how familiar are you with these caves? Oh, very familiar, yes. I come here about every day. I don't spend that much time at home lately. Just been uh, spelunking, mostly just trying to, you know, be with my thoughts. I haven't discovered any city of mirrors, but uh, maybe today's the day. An occupation of some kind always does one good. Tally ho! Tally ho! Vanya scrutinizes Hans, thinking he hears something in his voice. Vanya, roll an insight check. Fifteen. Vanya notices that as Hans is talking about spending all of his time in the cave system, his eyes flit to a tattered photograph on the dash of the same woman from the oil painting in his office. Vanya nods to himself in a silent solidarity. All your time's in the cave. I bet your wife has something to say about that. Hans stares into space for a beat and then says, Oh, oh no, she's, she's very supportive. And Hans rushes out of the car, carrying his gear in one hand. Theobald is already standing at the mouth of the cave, having exited the car the second he said tally-ho. Vanya pulls Bones aside for a second. Tread lightly, friend. You threatening me? I don't know. Figure it out yourself. Need I remind you of our handshake? As Jade walks past them to meet Theobald, she says, He's trying to help you. That'll be the day. Help from a Bolshevik. And the disgruntled party joins Theobald and Hans at the cave's mouth. Everybody make a perception check. Eleven. Fourteen. Nat twenty. Six. Theobald, you notice that the cave dips to a frightening degree almost immediately. And about twenty feet down is what looks like placid, icy cold water. Tread lightly, everyone. Bit of a plunge ahead. Hans goes about nailing a rope into the ground. Uh, hands. We're not gonna get into any super small spaces here, are we? Oh, yes. Super, super duper small. That's not great for old bones. It's okay. You, you will only have about 50% of your oxygen. Ah. Uh, That's all you need. Got it. Hans belays down with the rope. Belay. And then with a little splash, Hans gets in the water. Vanya waddles up to the hole and looks down. <laughs> we'll let us see if you are as cold as Mother Russia. And then Vanya starts belaying down very fast. Roll an athletics check. Seven. Vanya trips almost immediately and falls 25 feet down into the water. <laughs> Vanya will take six damage, bringing him down to 69 points of health. Jade jumps right in, no stranger to tight spaces. Jade, make an acrobatics check for your dive. 31. With almost no splash, Jade enters the water and resurfaces. Bugger, that's cold. Oh, I dare say that'll be a hard act to follow. Uh, Doc, can I talk to you for a second over here? Yes, about anything at any time. Maybe, uh, my services are best used guarding the car. Theobald looks down the imposing chasm, then back at Bones. I see. 
Mr. Mahoney, if you're at all daunted by the task at hand, that is nothing to be ashamed of. No, I, that's not what I said. I, I just think it's better if I guard the car. That seems... Bones, if you'll please let me finish. It is courage, courage, courage that raises the blood of life in crimson splendor. Live bravely and present a brave front to adversity. That's the Roman poet Horace for you. Now, Mr. Mahoney, I do not need you to like going down in that hole, but I do need you to be brave. Again, I, I didn't say I was scared. I just want that to reflect in the record. Yes, I shall remember it. When I secured your services as pilot, Mr. Mahoney, you were kind enough to offer up that you were an excellent bodyguard. Well, my body is going in that cave, and I order you to follow it down and guard it. And Theobald does the best version of Jade's dive that he can muster. Roll an acrobatics check. 22. Theobald's swimming instruction from his schooling days comes in handy as he leaps out from the edge and lands in the water with a very subtle splash. <gasps> Mr. Mahoney, we're waiting on you. Come on now, what are you chicken? Yeah, what are you chicken? Huh? Chicken? I'll show you who's chicken. Bones backs up to get a running start. Come on, Roy, you got this. You can do this. And Bones runs and leaps into the water. You can use the roof. Bones, roll an acrobatics check. 13. Bones slams into the water, belly flop style. Ah, ah. Oh, oh, God damn, that's cold. He takes five damage, bringing him down to 70 points of health. Congratulations, Mr. Mahoney. I, I knew you'd join us. Uh, 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 don't mention it, Doc. <laughs> Let's move on. <gasps> And Hans disappears beneath the water. No, we're not going. Yes, it seems we're going down even further. Roy, Vanya takes a dive. <sighs> yes, take courage, all. <gasps> of course, if you're afraid, you could just stay here, alone. And Jade follows them down. <gasps> oh, man. Bones takes a moment to look around him in the pool and look back up the rock wall. Only a little bit of light is leaking from the cave's edge, and nothing but darkness lies underneath Bones. <sighs> and Bones dives down. Underneath the water, all five float in a kind of suspended animation. The extremely lanky and athletic Hans leads them, holding an industrial-sized flashlight in his hands. A beam of light pierces the darkness, illuminating dark cave walls and underwater stalactites and stalagmites, implying that this cave may not have always been flooded. Hans kicks his enormous legs forward, and the rest follow him. Everybody make a constitution save. Nine. Nineteen. Twenty-one. Twenty-three. Fourteen. Everybody makes it to the next air pocket in a very tiny little enclosure. However, Bones does not rise to the surface right away. I say, where's old Mr. Mahoney got to? And then Bones surfaces, gargling and vomiting. Well, that was, a, that was a good spelunk. We can go home now, right, guys? Bones takes 10 damage, bringing him down to 60 points of health. Bones, your lungs are on fire. No, no, no. We have much more spelunk in the hood of us. Oh, good. <sighs> and all descend once again. <gasps> Everybody make another constitution save. Nat 20. 11. 22. 18. Nine. In the next enclosure, which is quite a bit larger, Bones, Vanya, and Hans surface. <sighs> it looks like we have some stragglers. All right, back down I go. <gasps> Hans, under the water, uses his flashlight to guide you. Make a perception check, Vanya. Nine. You are unable to find Jade and Theobald, but suddenly they appear in front of you, eyes wide, Mouths inflated with air, and bubbles leaking from their nose and mouth. You pull them forward, and they surface with you. <laughs> Theobald takes 12 damage, bringing him down to 48 points of health, while Jade takes 15 damage, bringing her down to 36 points of health. 
When my spelunk to go, hold your breath. <gasps> Everybody make one last constitution save. 10. 18. 20. 21. Botch. This time, the only ones who do crest in a final, very open and seemingly lit chamber are Vanya, Bones, and Jade. <laughs> I don't know why you guys read me the riot act. This is terrible. I'm eating my words right now. Bones looks around for Theobald. Ah, oh, shit. Bones dives down after Theobald. <gasps> Make a perception check. Nat 20. Hans is seemingly trying to get Theobald unstuck from a stalagmite. Theobald has gone limp and is unresponsive while Hans is trying to yank him free. Bones swims down and attempts to help free Theobald. Make an athletics check with advantage. Nat 20. Bones using his legs and with Hans's assistance, pulls Theo to the surface and Hans follows in tow. <laughs> uh, uh, Doc! Doc, you with me? Now there is plenty of ground to hop out onto. With one arm around Theobald and one arm swimming, Bones takes the limp explorer to the bank and hoists him up. Bones, make a medicine check. Four. Come on, Doc! Theo does not respond to your slaps of the face. Come on, Doc! Wake up! Vanya hops out of the water and rushes to Theobald's side. All right, very good work getting him here, but you're just giving him more bruises. He bruises easily. Vanya starts to compress Theobald's chest. Roll a medicine check. Sixteen and a fountain of water explodes from Theobald's mouth as he regains consciousness. <laughs> Theobald takes 20 damage, bringing him down to 28 points of health. Theobald takes a moment to survey his surroundings. The party is now in a sort of underground dome. Golden painted half circles stretch from floor to ceiling covered in Nordic runes, many of which are scraped away by the erosion caused by this cave flood. There are also crude paintings on the walls, ones that depict a woman with long hair holding an apple, as well as several stoic and dangerous looking warriors. The paint is chipped in many places, so sometimes discerning these takes a moment. Light comes from minuscule, almost porous holes in the rock from all angles above. And in the center of this room is a pedestal, seemingly made of some kind of Grecian marble on which is resting a small golden cylinder and a folded letter. How very curious. Here we are in Norway, and that's Grecian marble, and there's a, a woman who clearly appears to be the representation of Eve. Theobald, make a history check. 26. <gasps> no, no, that's, that's Edith, the Norse goddess of the orchard. Hot damn, you got all that being conscious for five seconds? Well, it was five seconds, Mr. Mahoney, that I spent in observation. I've never seen this cavern before. Amazing. We may well be the first human beings to set foot in this place in... in a millennium. Theobald approaches the letter. It seems rather new. Though I am always ready to be proven wrong, Theobald picks it up and opens it. My love, should it be that you are behind me only a step or two? Fret not, for I would have taken the apple from this sacred place and will journey forth to the first city. I pray that you meet me there in time for us to step into paradise together. However, if this letter finds you too late, know that I waited for you as long as I could. It was never my wish to find it without you, but now that it lies in front of me so tantalizingly, I fear that I will not be able to resist. You will always be the one true love of my life, and even though I have faith that we shall journey forth together, I find my eyes well with tears. I fear this omen, but will keep hope, as you would have begged me to. Who knows? Perhaps we shall face down the Ottomans together, with an apple in our hands each. To life everlasting, Sophia. And at the bottom of this letter are scribbled coordinates. Theobald, make a history check. 27. I say how very curious. It looks like we have another long trip ahead of us. These coordinates are for Baghdad, perhaps the site of the old Mesopotamian ruins. I'll need a map to be sure. Don't you want to know what some of these ruins are? Oh, yes, the ruins! Read on! Read on, man! Okay, it looks like these are partial and incomplete, but uh, let's start here. 
the goddess guards her orchard with flame and death. And then over here we have banished we who are not worthy to taste of her fruit. And over here we have Eden's forgiveness will be withheld from her children, and henceforth shall life everlasting be denied them and their ancestors for... And over here we have our humble world with ash and fire, until we only see ourselves in our transgressions. And then over here we have the sacred orchard, and then finally over here we have the watcher ignored cannot be blamed. Criminy. Yeah, it's a bit intense. This all means something to you, Gav. This altar was probably made by the Edenian clune. We don't know much about them, but they were very mysterious, ancient, were legendary warriors. They called themselves the Eden Sentries and claimed that the gods themselves had entrusted them with the secret of eternal love. For their reason, warriors in this clan were rumored to have extraordinarily long lives, though this was never confirmed. Splendid! That draws an interesting parallel to my readings of the Bible, which warns that the Garden of Eden is guarded by cherubim and flaming sword. And now for that golden cylinder. Miss Pickett, would you mind inspecting it for any deterrence? Jade approaches the cylinder and looks it over. Roll an investigation check. 22. After closely inspecting it, Jade. Well, looks ordinary enough, but I gotta say, Gov, looks like they switched out this cylinder for whatever was really important. And, um, by the way, I wouldn't touch that weight if I were you. Seems like it's protecting us from something bloody awful. Well, I won't be the one to argue with your expertise, Miss Pickett. Has anyone found anything else of note that we should inspect before we take our leave? Hans, is everything all right? I'm okay. It's just I uh, used to spelunk in these curves with uh, my wife, Emma, and we never phoned this room. She would have loved it. Some tombs I try to be cheery and upboot, but um, I just spelunk in these curves, trying to be closer to her. Thank you for showing me this new room. I'll treasure it all woos. Oh, Hans, on the contrary, thank you. Your help to our expedition has been immeasurable, and I am so sorry if any painful memories have been brought to the surface. It's okay. Sometimes it's, uh, it's good to cry. So she just didn't like coming down here anymore? Oi, Yank. Shut your hole. Yeesh, who died? Oh. The wife. Jade and Vanya look at each other and shake their heads. Well, we'd better get a move on if we want to find and possibly overtake the writer of this letter. And it's a long way to the Ottoman Empire. Now back into this cold water with you all. Tally-ho! This has been a Hero Club production, produced by Nick Williams, George Primavera, and Jack Quaid, with associate producers Marty Abbey Schneider and Dylan McCullum. Voice acting by George Primavera, Nick Williams, Marty Abbey Schneider, Dylan McCullum, Lelia Symington, Jack Quaid, and Helen Laser. The City of Mirrors Overture, composed and produced by Matthew McCullum. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod, Ben Doyle, and Matthew McCollum for their amazing music, Mage Hand Press for their genius D&D 5th edition homebrew, Marty Abbey Schneider for his incredible artwork, and Ali Catanese, our hero. Follow us on Instagram at Hero Club Podcast, on Twitter at Hero Club Pod, and check out our website, HeroClubPodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and welcome to the club. Never seen such a croft before. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck the so, fucking landing. So it's fucking great. I'm so sorry.
I'm just gonna fuck. I'm sorry. Fuck accuracy. I can't do it. But I'm just. It's just gonna be insane.